Okay. All right. So, all right. So this is history in stone, hidden cemeteries of Giaga. So our goal for this program today is to make you aware of the hidden cemeteries that are dotting the landscape of Geauga County by the roadside. Some of them are just out in the middle of fields. Some of them are in, um, in someone's woods on private property. Um, so what we're gonna do is visit a few of our favorites and talk about people that are buried there. And we'll talk about um, the symbolism found in cemeteries and other interesting aspects of cemeteries. What the program isn't going to do is we're not going to do a comprehensive of every cemetery because there are a lot of cemeteries. We're, we're just going to cover our favorites. So next, yep, here we go. Next. All right. So how did this all get started? Well, there's this, um, our, our chief naturalist, John Kolar, he He's interested in all kinds of history things, and he did a couple of um, cemetery programs many years ago. And then it sort of fell by the wayside, and Denise and I got interested in that as well. So in the years that followed, we'd do a cemetery program somewhere every, you know, every other year, every couple of years or something like that. So anyway, that was the um, inspiration for us. And then, um, then to... Uh, research some of these places. Mm -hmm. if, if you go to Burton Library in the James Room, there's this big book, a monumental work, and um, the inscriptions and interments in Jaga County, Ohio through 1983. The authors, Violet Warren and Jeanette Teeter Grosvenor. So um, that was one of our main go-to resources for doing some of the research on that. And then our other one is this website, Find a Grave. It is awesome. Um, you can search for people's names. You can search for cemetery names. So here's, here's um, you would type in, for instance, Draga County. If you knew the name of the cemetery, you could put that in, but we just wanted to um, come up with a list of cemeteries in Draga County. So. Uh, that's how we we discovered some of these cool places. Right. Yeah. Right. And I wanted to mention, if you look um, up here, it says you can. There are five thousand three hundred seventy-one, seven hundred twenty-nine right. cemeteries in two hundred forty-four different countries. So you can look up quite a lot of uh, different. Oh, sorry. Cemeteries. Going oh, going, we're going back. <laughs> it's like, sorry, I should only let Linda handle the controls. <laughs> sorry, trying to drive here. So. so, yeah, so you can you can look up by person's name, um, by a cemetery, by a county, um, by a state, a, 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 state a, a, a town. You say, I know this cemetery is in Chardon. So I, that's all I know. It's in Chardon. And you can just type in Chardon. Jugga County, Ohio, uh, United States, and then it'll bring up every cemetery in Chardon. Yeah, it's an amazing website. So we really enjoyed um, having that resource to help us along the way. So anyway, so now we're going to start sharing our favorite, some of our favorite cemeteries, why they made our list. And, um, and our first cemetery, it's our first and it's our favorite. It's Memorial Cemetery also called Lower Cemetery or Fox Cemetery, and it's located in Burton. So I'll do the little yeah. thing. So up here is um, Burton, uh, Burton Square. I see the log cabin. This is Route 700. And then here's the wastewater treatment plant. Then there's a little road that goes back through the woods, and there's a cemetery. Okay. So yeah, and it's the name of the road. It's called Memorial Drive. Right. So you have to, you drive down the sewage treatment plant road and then the um, driveway to the cemetery sort of veers off to the left as you right. get towards where it looks like you can't drive any farther. Right, <laughs> so. yeah, it's just a tiny little, tiny little road. And so here's the, um, the entrance to Memorial Cemetery. And, um, 
So in the history of Jaga County, there's a little pioneer history book. Um, uh, records show that in in March on March 17th of 1824, a man named Simeon Rose deeded one and a half acres to the proprietor of Burton Township for the purpose of a burying ground. And this is what was called the Lower Cemetery. And recently, um, when I visited to take some pictures there, I noticed that the um, American Legion had posted this nice sign that has a list of all of the soldiers, all of the veterans that are buried in that particular cemetery. And um, so this other neat little book, The Pioneer and General History of Geauga County, um, describes the um, burials in this particular cemetery as sleeping near the river. So this cemetery um, is located on a, a sandy knoll uh, on slightly higher ground and um, of the floodplain of the, uh, the Cuyahoga River. So the river is like um, back in this area, just a short distance over here. So it is very low ground, but this area is a slightly higher. Well, in 1919, the uh, city of Akron purchased the surrounding land and it was believed that this area was going to be flooded. So they had made tentative plans to move the entire cemetery, all the burials up to Welton Cemetery, which is up on the hill in Burton, but this was never done. So this old burial ground remains a secluded and lonely landmark. So we're gonna talk about some of the um, noteworthy folks that are buried in this cemetery and the first um, gentleman is Thomas Umberfield or Umberville. It's listed both ways. Um, born in 1745, died in 1850. He was formerly uh, from Connecticut. And so the, the story in the pioneer history of Jaga County says that, um, that they arrived in Burton. He arrived in Burton with his wife, Lydia, and five children at noon on June 21st. 1798. They were the first family to settle in Burton, and um, they apparently stepped from a rude sled that they were riding in beside a white tent door in a great woods. And then it goes on to say their garden was begun on June 26th, and their house was begun on June 30th. And then a rattlesnake was killed while cutting the road from the camp to Mr. Umberville's lot. And they said it was eaten with great relish. Mm, yum, rattlesnake. Mm, yeah. But but that was a, it was a food source. Um, so then it says they moved into their house on Friday, July 6th, and it was the first time they had slept in a house since April 22nd of that year. Do you realize that's just a week? It took them one week to build their house. No, I think it was the previous April. Oh, oh no, <laughs> no. I mean, they built their house on, they oh, started on June 30th, 30th and they, their house, they moved in their house in July 6th. That minute took one week to build their life. Oh, okay. Well, well, it must have just been a different time frame. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. So anyway, um, so then uh, the other interesting thing about the umber fields is that, um, the nearby Indians, the Native Americans who were living here at that time were friendly and the chief took a fancy to Thomas Umber Umberfield's daughter, whose name was Limery. And he offered a thousand dollars and his oldest son for her. But of course her dad refused. And uh, then the chief threatened to steal her. So for a long time, she wasn't allowed to go anywhere alone. Um, so anyway, Limery actually eventually got married to uh, Simeon Rose, who was the man who deeded the property for the burying ground. So anyway, um, Thomas Umberville, um, his job while he was here, he was a tailor and he also kept a tavern in Burton. Okay, so Seth Hayes is our next uh, Revolutionary War soldier. Uh, he was in um, a Massachusetts regiment and as you can see here, 
he actually passed away on December 25th on Christmas Day, 1815. And, and they don't know when when he was born. So anyway, so his family arrived in Burton at, in 1800 and they uh, built a cabin along the bank of Hobson Creek, which is near where Sunrise Farm is um, on um, Route 87 in Burton. And um, from this pioneer history, we get lots of really good stories. So here's a story about Seth Hayes. So he was considered a strong man and a hunter, and he could pick his game from undercover by surprise or by fight. So from Parks Penn, that was one of the other settlers, a pig was stolen. Hayes pursued and the bear dropped the pig. Lyman Parks was sent back to get a gun. Hayes scared the bear away, but he returned, only to be scared away again. The third time the bear came back, he was within a rod of the pig, which I think is about like six feet. And the bear stood up on his hind legs. Well, Hayes knew that this meant it was a fight. So off came his big hat and he was shaking it in front of his face and he jumped at the bear with a yell. And over went the brute and ran off not to return again. So these are the kinds of really interesting stories that you get from these pioneer histories. So unfortunately, Seth Hayes, his wife and three of his children died in an epidemic in uh, the winter of 1815 and 1816. Now they were buried on private property and the property owner did not want people coming to his property to, um, uh, to you know, see the grave site. So I don't know if it was private property at the time and that got transferred, but whatever, they, they uh, set up a memorial for him in Memorial Cemetery. So I don't even know if he's actually buried here, but his memorial is here. And um, this memorial looks very new because it is on um, Memorial Day uh, 1987, the um, Samuel Huntington chapter of the Sons of the American Revolution had a, had a ceremony where they dedicated new stones to the Revolutionary War soldiers. And you're gonna see a couple of uh, the newer stones here in the next few slides, so go ahead. So this is Caleb Fowler, and I'm gonna to try to do this. Um, oh yeah, the Zoom thing. The Zoom thing here where I can make it a little bigger. Okay, so I'm gonna try this. So here, you can barely make out, you can make out that this is Fowler, and you can barely see that this is Caleb. So this is would be very typical of what the stones were like, but, um, so he got a new stone, go ahead and click. He got a new stone. So here's his new stone that was installed in um, 1987. All right, um, Eli Fowler uh, was the son of Revolutionary War soldier Caleb, and he came to Burton in 1798. And here's another rattlesnake story. It says, while helping to cut the road from Conneaut to Cleveland, he killed a great rattlesnake, chopping off the head with an ax. When its skin was stretched on a beech tree one foot through, so one foot in diameter, um, the width of the snake skin reached more than halfway around the tree. Uh, the meat was cooked and eaten. And then another weird story is that Eli heard that the chewing of a snake would cure toothache so he forked the head of another rattler. He forked it down with a crotched stick and um, somebody held the tail of the snake while Eli bit the entire length of the snake's back. And it was said that his teeth never ached afterwards. So go figure, whatever. <laughs> that's that's, that's how old yep. wives' tails start, yep. right? Um, Eli Fowler was married to Martha Sperry Maybe some of you recognize the name Sperry, um, Sperry Road. And so anyway, they spent their lives on a farm where they settled and they, they didn't actually have any children. So um, one of the things that we like to look at when we go to cemeteries is the symbolism that's on some of the gravestones. And so there's four examples here of um, some symbolism. So 
in the um, far left on the left side of the screen there that flower. Um, we'll see if we can zoom in on it there. Yeah. So flowers, what did they represent? Well, it was oftentimes a symbol of immortality. And then if you look at the picture there, uh, the next one, you might see some what looks like a drapery there hanging. And so draperies re uh, represented mourning. And then you can see just some faint texture behind those draperies that those represent clouds and clouds were, you know, a symbol of, of heaven. And then moving to the third picture there, um, the um, weeping willow and the urn. So the urn represented the soul and the weeping willow tree, of course, I think um, mostly people would guess that it meant sadness or mourning. But it meant different things in different cultures. And like, for instance, if if that tree uh, was found on a Native American grave, it would represent that it was an Iroquois grave. So in the first half of the 19th century, folks were interested in the Greeks and the Romans because they were republics. And our country was just, you know, a new democracy basically at that time. So folks were interested in Greek architecture and things like that. And so oftentimes um, the gravestones reflected that. And so for instance, the urn for uh, in, in Greece was used to keep the cre cremated remains of you know, relatives and things like that. So, um, so there's an interest in Greek architecture. And then finally, the last picture there on the right, the book, the Bible or the book was often used on gravestones of ministers or clergymen, or it could be used to on a de, on a gravestone of a very you know devoted religious person. So the book could re represent a person's good deeds, like is written in the in the book of life. Um, so that's some of the symbol symbolism associated with um, some of the graves at at least at Memorial Cemetery. Okay. All right, so now we're going to travel to another cemetery. This one is uh, Morton Cemetery in Newberry. So um, here's Bell Street and here is um, Mon Mon Road. So this is over here. This is actually in a long driveway that goes back to someone's house. So Linda found this cemetery. Go ahead and click that. Here's a picture of it. Linda found this cemetery because she's fond of doing something called geocaching. So, and there are many cemeteries included in geocaching sites. So she's gonna tell you a little bit more about geocaching and how she found this. So this was so cool because I live on Bell Road. And so um, I got started into geocaching because Trevor, our recreation specialist made this nice geo trail along the Maple Highlands Trail where, where you, could, you could earn a coin, which I, I actually have the coin in my pocket right here, I'll show you. Um, and in fact, we can take a look at this afterwards too. But I wanted this nice shiny, this nice shiny gold coin. So I did the geo trail. And as I was doing that, I was noticing that as I logged the geocaches, I was getting these little digital rewards. Like a, um, there was this thing they were called the wonders of the world. And I'm thinking wonders of the world, what's this? Well, if you log a geocache, you automatically get whatever wonder of the world is attached to that particular geocache. So anyway, I needed, I needed a certain wonder of the world. And so I was searching on the website and I'm like, Morton Cemetery, uh, Bell Road, where the heck? I didn't even know there was a cemetery on Bell Road. So let me read to you what it says about Morton Cemetery on the geocaching website. So this was the description that, um, that, they, that they, they had. It says, um, the cemetery is open dawn till dusk and shares a driveway with a private residence. Please be respectful of both locations. Ignore the no trespassing signs. The Newberry Sexton says visiting is fine. The sign was meant for the hoodlums. So if you're a hoodlum, Maybe you should skip this one. So anyway, I wasn't a hoodlum. So I had to go there because I wanted to see this cemetery. And um, so I don't know, Can there is a geocache hidden in that picture. 
And I don't know if you can see it, but I'll circle it. It's right there. And so a closer up picture of the geocache is this little tube that you unscrew and there's a log inside it and you sign it and you put it back and, and you check off that you've logged that geocache. So that's how I found this really cool cemetery that I never knew existed. So there's another cool story <laughs> that's associated with this cemetery. So I don't know if any of you know this guy. Do you know this guy? <laughs> well, anyway, you, yeah. you're all muted, so yeah. don't answer. But anyway, his name is Brigham Young. So there's a university named after him. He was Mormon. All right. And so the story goes that um, that uh, Brigham Young married this lady whose name was Mary Ann Angel. And Mary Ann Angel was the cousin of Mrs. Morton, who, whose family had that cemetery, which was behind their house. So they had a house on Bell Road, I'm assuming. I, I tried to look for the address of it. There is a house there, but I'm not sure that it was the original house. So anyway, um, Mrs. Morton's husband, Abraham Morton, was not in favor of the marriage, and he would not let Brigham Young um, come into the house. So Brigham Young and Mary Ann Angel were married on the front porch of the Morton home. And that happened in, what's my date? 1834. Uh, 18, what? It's, I 1834. Okay, 1834. Yes, 1834. So Brigham Young was 24 and Mary Ann Angel was only 18 years old when they got married. Now, obviously this is not them at 18. And right. I, I couldn't find young pictures of them. So I picked pictures so that they look maybe like they were more similar in age. Anyway, anyway, Brigham Young was an interesting guy. Um, he had something like 51 wives. Mary Ann Angel was his, his first. So he was married once and his wife died. Then he married Mary Ann Angel. And then afterwards, he married 50, Many others, 51 yeah. more ladies. Um, so anyhow, so that was an interesting story. <laughs> and and <laughs> what, she had to sign some kind of document saying that she was okay. So with him yeah, she had married. she had to, she was okay with the plural marriage idea. So anyway, go figure. But it was just an interesting story. And all of that because I found a geocache in the cemetery. All right, so this cemetery too has some uh, Revolutionary War soldiers buried there. So this is some of some of their graves. Yep, Abraham and Morton, Morton yep. right there. Yep. There he is. Uh, so here again, uh, there's several gravestones that have obelisks in. Well, you see ob obelisks in lots of cemeteries, and what does it represent? Well, it was a symbol that was quite popular. Again. Uh, because of the Greek architecture. It meant um, rebirth. Uh, it stood for a connection between earth and heaven. Oftentimes there was an orb at the top uh, of the obelisk, which symbolizes a celestial body and the deceased's heavenly reward. Um, it also symbolized faith. Uh, some obelisks instead of, have, instead of having the orb at the top would have an urn at the top, which we said previously was um, representative of the soul. And so there's, I mean, there's like what, four or five, six headstones in there that have the ob obelisk in here. Now um, we're going to show you some symbolism here too. Here's a close up uh, of that headstone. And so the symbolism here, I saw the wings. And so I'm thinking, I'm looking where, so what does the bird mean? Well, a flying bird is a symbol of rebirth. But um, then there was another symbol called a winged face, which was a symbol of the soul in flight to heaven. And sometimes it would actually be um, like an effigy of the deceased person whose face was on the winged bird. Yeah, in this, it looks like a T, but you said you could never find anything for right. a T, and there, but there's something below the T, so maybe it's really just a, a face. It looks like a face yeah. to me the I more think I look at it. Yeah, it's like a little face. Yeah. So that means what, the soul going the to soul, heaven? Yeah, the symbol um, of the soul in flight to heaven. And of course, you can see the texture in the background. Again, those are clouds. Wow. Yep. They're going to happen. And then there's um, other markers. There's a lot of... Um, like uh, Masonic 
and fraternal organizations that place markers by the grave. And so the one on the right is actually one for women. Um, the, the letters P, L, E, F, um, sometimes it has a crown with a shield, was a symbol of the Fithian Sisters, a fraternal organization, Pythian Sisters, P-Y-T-H-I-N, Sisters, a fraternal organization for women. The letters P-L-E-F stood for their motto, which was purity, love, equality, and fidelity. And you'll see a lot of those uh, metal markers for different um, wars. So each war had a different symbolic marker. So you could tell what war um, someone served in by those metal markers. So now this is a tiny cemetery. You can see this is Route 422 and this is Rapids Road. And there's a tiny cemetery here called Patch Cemetery. Okay, blink and you'll miss it. So this again was a cemetery that Linda found because of a geocache. Yeah, so the geocache in this cemetery was called the Gopher Patch because they're, they're, it said, be careful when you go there because there's groundhog holes. So you don't want to step in one, but this is pretty much the whole cemetery. There's only um, 25 burial sites here. Um, there is a Revolutionary War soldier. This is um, uh, Benedict Alford. And that's just a close up of their graves, which I could hardly get a picture of because there was a whole bunch of um, like green briar, uh, green briar and, and yeah. multiflora robes yeah, that I, I was, had to crawl through. Yeah, there. I was back in there and I told <laughs> her she she missed a great opportunity of me like being completely entangled in this, this, yeah. this uh, briars because I was literally like falling down wrapped in all of these in these yeah, briars. Thankfully, I had long sleeves on because I would have been really, really messed up. Yeah, it was not easy to get that picture. So this is a little bit more uh, about symbolism in this one. So um, over here, you see uh, oak leaves. So oak leaves were like um, for longevity or long life. Also, we talked about in um, other cultures, in Native American culture, the oak leaf uh, represented the Algonquin um, tribe. So if you if it was a Native American grave and they had an oak leaf, that meant that they were from that tribe. It's also a symbol of faith and virtue, strength, power, and it was frequently found on military graves. Then we have this uh, at the top, um, this palm frond. At first I thought it was um, a lily leaf, but normally the lily leaf comes with the actual flower. So we decided this was a palm frond and that means uh, victory over death. So it means that person has gone on to heaven. And then the third and final symbolism in this, I'm going to see if I can magnify it a little bit. This one's really hard. I don't think I can do it, but it's over here in the corner. This is uh, a shell. So the shell means a uh, baptism and rebirth. So that would that would mean this person was baptized and they've gone on to their you know reward in heaven. So right. next one. Okay. So another way that we have found cemeteries is um, through uh, word of mouth, through friends. A friend of ours who also was a coworker. Um, her name is Sandy Wolf, and her ancestors were from Russell. And she found out that um, her family actually built a house that's still standing um, on Route 87 here, just a, a short distance uh, from the Westwoods, uh, the Green Fisher Farm. And they had a cemetery. Um, the cemetery is on private property. Um, on Route 87, it's you know on someone's driveway, just like the Morton Cemetery. And this is a picture of the cemetery where my friend's ancestors are buried. So going on to another cemetery, we have a lot of cemeteries that we really liked. We had to really try to cut it down to just this many, because there's many, you know, like 82 to, is that what Find a Eight, Grave said? Find like, a Grave said At least 82, 82 cemeteries in, in Jagged County. County. So this is Williams Cemetery. It is on Clarendon Troy Road. It's about halfway between um, Burton and Chardon. 
So go ahead if you want to click. So this is a beautiful, beautiful and peaceful cemetery. And it is um, the focal point of the cemetery is this enormous red oak. It, it creates this, this like returning to nature feeling. It's, su it's such a beautiful little cemetery. And he wanted to talk about the importance of oak, oak trees. trees. Yeah. So during the pandemic time, <laughs> Many of us were able to take advantage of, of these online um, webinars and things. And so one of our favorite speakers is a guy by the name of Doug Tallamy. He's a professor at, I can't remember what university, but he's kind of like Delaware, or Delaware, something. something like that. Um, so he um, uh, is a conservationist biologist and has written some books. You know, when we consider all of our environmental issues, you know, most of us are like, oh, they're just so overwhelming. We're just want to throw our hands up in despair. But he's like, don't do that. If nothing else, plant an oak tree. Because oak trees support the largest diversity of caterpillars than many other trees that grow in Jaga County. And why is, why is it important to have a supply of caterpillars? Well, that's the main source of bird food for when, when birds are feeding their babies in the spring and summer. So anyway, um, there's this gorgeous red oak tree that stands right in the middle of this of this cemetery. So plant an oak, that's the importance of the oak tree right. there. Yeah, right. And here's another um, view of this beautiful, it is so beautiful and peaceful cemetery. Very so. pastoral in nature. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we found some interesting symbolism here on the grave of Mary Hafner. And so um, we took a shot of the front and back of her marker there. Um, so on the one side is a sheaf of wheat, which represents harvest. It's usually found on older people's gravestones, um, might be a symbol of old age, a fruitful life, or the divine harvest. And then on the other side, um, there was a cross that was wrapped in um, ivy. Ivy is either a symbol of eternal life or undying affection and friendship. Oops, wait, we, we gotta go back. We gotta go back, we gotta go back, gotta go back. So we're looking at this marker and we're like, what is this? Because we're, we're like touching it and it's like, it feels like stone, but we would tap on it and it pinged like metal. So we decided that it is indeed the metal zinc. Zinc mark markers were made by a company called the Monumental Bronze Company of Bridgeport, Connecticut. Um, and they made these markers between 1874 and 1914. Now they marketed these um, markers as um, these gravestones as um, white bronze. They called them white bronze. And they told people that they were as durable or more durable than marble, and they were only one third the cost. And the thing is, I'm going to see if I can um, uh, make this larger. It's so hard. I, I found it. I okay, found it. it. Okay. Okay. So we're going to look. This person passed away in uh, 1894. So this is over 100 years old. And it is crisp. You can read it. I mean, so many of the markers that are that old, you can't read them unless they are engraved in marble or granite. And um, so it was true that it they certainly were um, a, a good cost if they were one third the cost. And the other thing that um, should have told us that it was uh, zinc was this kind of um, bluish gray color. If you go to older cemeteries and you see these really light colored, not white, but kind of bluish gray, chances are they're zinc. And yeah. they will hold up really well, but they need to have like a structure behind them. Like there's usually a metal structure inside there that's holding it all up uh, because the, the zinc is brittle and will crack or sag over time. So um, as long as they put it together well, it will last just as long as any of the, the granite headstones that you'll right. see. Oh, and a lot of the old headstones that, that you see in these older cemeteries are made of sandstone. And 
some of them you, you just they're so um weathered and eroded there's lichen that um the um lichen it's a combination of a fungus and an algae that grows on it and it just breaks it, you know it breaks it, it down back it down. into dirt basically right, yeah. and so um but the zinc markers boy they're really nice and crisp and this is a great example of one and there's a revolutionary war, war soldier buried here. This is Thaddeus Brad, Bradley, and there's his headstone, but there's a government marker there as well um, that, that was placed in his honor. Um, when you go to some of the cemeteries, you'll see some headstones that are very small. And oftentimes those small headstones were for children. And so that diamond-shaped headstone there in the middle belongs to Gertie Hafner, age two months. And then her sibling with the little stone on the right, who's, we, could, we couldn't even make out the name on the headstone. So, and there is the Williams family marker. And notice that the man's name was Delos. Um, Let's see if we can. Can you I'll, zoom? Yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll try to do it because I, right, right I can see it. I can set it. Yep. Okay. Okay, we'll see if we can zoom it in for you. Yeah. yeah. So, I don't know. Yeah, there you can see it. Delos. So again, in keeping with the interest in the Greek architecture, that was a that whole thing was basically in Europe, it was a characteristic of the Romantic era, which yeah. was the 1800s period. So, yes, they were yeah. and interested so, in, in, in Greek and Roman stuff. Everything. Yep. So, even names. E right, even names, as in this guy's Delos, name. that reminds me sort of Greek name. And in, in one of the previous slides, I forgot to mention it, but um, one of the um, guy's names was Apollos. So anyway, just in keeping with that Greek theme again. All right. Next. Okay, so now we're moving on to, okay, here's a cemetery that you have probably sped by if you've driven on Route 44, you know, and be careful, don't really take time to look, but it's there, <laughs> and it's kind of, uh, you can click, so it's kind of large for a hidden cemetery, but some of really important geogans are buried there, and here's a picture of it, and you can go ahead and click that, such as Lemuel Henderson. Okay, guess what's named after him. So he was born in New Haven, Connecticut in 1782, and he came to the Western Reserve in 1803. And he was the first settler in Newberry. So there were other people that had bought property, but he was the first person to actually build a cabin and live in Newberry. And he settled at the foot of the big pond. We know what that is now, don't we? Punderson, Lake Punderson. And um, he developed, uh, he built a cabin there and he built a mill. This guy did everything. He built buildings. He was a surveyor. He was a land agent. That meant that he um, helped the people in Connecticut who had uh, land holdings out here. He helped them sell property to other people. So he traveled all across the area selling property and um, he became one of the leading citizens in Newberry. He was the postmaster, he was a township official, and he eventually became a state representative. So there's just one uh, really cool person. And so there. some interesting nature that's connected with this is that there's these really big white pine trees that grow on, on top of the um, this knoll here, sort of high ground. And it is a well-known place as a turkey vulture roosting site in the spring and the summer. So when I start looking for turkey vultures in the spring, usually Pretty driving, soon. yep, actually, although I saw them already, but it wasn't here. But anyway, so anyway, the roosting turkey vultures, I just thought that it was pretty, um, cool considering that yeah, it's, it's an appropriate it's, bird yeah, for, for a for graveyard. A yeah, yeah, that's right. And so we did a cemetery program there uh, a couple years ago with the um, Sons of the American Revolution honored some of the uh, Revolutionary War soldiers that are buried there. The The Boy Scouts were there. There was a color guard. It was, it was a very um, really neat um, sort of ceremony there. And then um, I noticed that there were a couple of interesting headstones here. So again, um, a tree trunk or a tree stump. Um, 
I found out said that um, usually marks the grave of Woodman of the World members. So what what are Woodman of the World? Well, I don't um, know. My mother is my mother in law is a Woodman of the World. I don't know if anybody it, knows. I did. I looked. Oh, it up. you looked it up. Uh, yes, okay. of course. Linda, I what up. is it? So it is a fraternal benefit society. Mm -hmm. And they're still in existence today. They, they sell like insurance and things like that. But one of the um, sort of perks or whatever that they did was that they would offer gravestones like these um, to members of, of their society. And so what does is, what is the tree trunk stand for as far as the symbolism goes? Um, um, a life cut short, or at least the brevity of life. Um, severed tree branches are uh symbol of mortality um and then if you look at the picture on the left the number of broken branches on the tree stump indicate the deceased family members who were interred at that site and so there's one two three four five and then the whole stump is six there and there's six names listed there on the scroll which is also a symbol of you know scripture and yeah, things like that scripture. And then over here on the right, let's see if I can find the um, little, um, where is the, uh, uh, where is it? Uh, one more, right, right there, there, right there, there it is. Okay. Sorry, um, we keep off. I know, it's like we, we got the Zoom feature here that we can't see. So also connected with some of these tree stumps were other symbols like anchors, lilies, vines. And I don't know if you can see, but right in the middle, there is a calla lily in a pot that's growing there. And so the calla lily, was a symbol of beauty. And so there it is on that. And then you can see just above that, there's some ivy, which was the symbol of eternal life or friendship, friendship. affection. Yep, okay. okay. All right. And here's just another view of the this cemetery from another uh, vantage point. But I wanted to point out that um, over here, we can see Mm, the Phragmites. Okay, we don't yeah, won't we talk don't about like <laughs> But anyway, this, this is a low area. This is where the mill pond was for, remember, Lemuel Peterson built, uh, Punderson, I mean, uh, had a mill. And this was uh, an area um, for the mill pond. Yep. So, and you can even see part of the old dam yeah. on, from 44 mm, right. if you're coming right. north on 44. Right. So. Okay. So this one, I, I forgot to do a map for this one. Um, so this one, it's in Parkman, right? Mumford. I, is it in Parkman? Yeah, where is it? Yes. Park? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now we can't quite remember where this one is. It's yes, but it's, Parkman. It's, that's or Troy. 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 It's in Troy. Troy. Okay. Yep. Anyway, so this one caught Linda's attention. She was driving by and stopped and took some pictures because, um, as you can see over here. It had a mausoleum. It's kind of really remote. It's in like farm fields. You can just, you know, a tree line here, but there's no developed area or anything here. But here's the cemetery and it's not really tiny, uh, but it has a mausoleum and it has a lot of grave markers and it's really so it just caught our attention. And we also wanted to talk about mausoleums. Yeah. So it's a perfect time to do that. So yeah, this so the first burial in this cemetery was in 1852, from from what the, our sources said. And when you look at it, there seems to be sort of a newer section, which is the picture on the left. The the grave markers are a little bit well. There's some of them that are made of marble. They're a little bit in better condition, and some of the the burials they're a little bit more recent. But then on the other side, you've got all of these old markers again, um, with and some of them are you know very hard to read because they're old and of course we have the mumford grave sites there and then um the mausoleum this is the thrasher family mausoleum and if i thought it might be interesting to find out about the history of the mausoleum i, I didn't really know what the purpose of it but it goes back to um ancient times like 350 bc there was a king, his name was King Mausolus, and he was um, an Anatolian king who ruled an ancient kingdom in Asia Minor near the Mediterranean Sea. And when he died, his wife um, had a huge structure built for him for his gravesite. 
And so the thing was sitting on this massive stone platform. It was surrounded by columns and it really towered over the surrounding landscape. And it was one of those things that became one of the seven um, ancient wonders of the world, which was one of the geocaches that I had to find, not that there was a geocache at the cemetery. But anyway, um, so the name of that wonder of the ancient world was the mausoleum at Halicarnassus. So, and we'll, show you, and we'll show you a picture of it in a minute. So <laughs> mausoleum, the term mausoleum came from King Mausolus. That's how it got its name. So if we look a little bit closer at the um, Thrasher um, yeah, mausoleum kind of here. That, that thing is on the roof. Yes. It looks really strange okay. up there. But again, it's the tree trunk, so the brevity of life. But there's some symbols on here. If I can find the, um, uh, where is um, it? Uh, that's it. That's it, okay. So if you come over here and look at this, um, there are some fern fronds here. So um, ferns were um, represented humility and sincerity. And then right there, it looks to me like there's a remnant of a lion's head, which was a symbol for um, strength. And so then um, this next slide, is a, a gif of the mausoleum at Halicarnassus. So that's, there you go. that's, that's what, what it looks like. like. Here it goes, we're let it yeah. get built again. Do yeah, do we'll do just do see do it. Do. Ta -da. So do we don't have music to go yeah, on really. like that. Like the, that TV show, you know. So but we just want you to see it again because I want to see it again. Look at that. I mean, so, it had to have been spectacular. Yeah. And now it's, you know, all it's that's left there. of it is it's, like it's ruins the of the column. I think the columns, base yeah. is there, but that's about so. it. Yep. Okay, now right. we're just going to do what I call drive-by cemeteries. Um, they're in no particular order. In fact, they're crisscrossing Geauga County. These are um, cemeteries. I didn't really delve into who's buried there. They're just right along the road that you can easily see. And um, so, uh, like I said, we're just literally crisscrossing Jagged County. So this one is is um, in, um, it's on Clarendon Troy Road in Hampton, and it's called Sisson's Corner Cemetery. And um, it was opened in 1822, so 1822 to 1877. Now, the next cemetery, this one, again, crisscrossing, we're now in uh, Russell Township, South Russell. or South Russell, excuse me, South Russell. Uh, this is Bell Road, just a half mile west of Route 306, and it's called Rarick Cemetery. And there it is. Here's the road. Literally, that's the white line at the end of the road and steps to this very pastoral cemetery with some very old looking markers. Yeah. In fact, um, I can't remember what Rarick, um, what his first name was, but anyway, he was a rev I think a Revolutionary War soldier that's buried in this particular cemetery. And so if you want to visit the cemetery, my suggestion is that you go farther down the road and park at South Russell Village Park. And if you don't know anything about South Russell Village Park, it is the stronghold for that bird called the bobolink in Jaga County. You can go there in the spring and part of the summer and see bazillions yeah, of bobolinks right yeah, yeah they're like you know 50s in the 50s bobolinks um just flying over that field so they nest there and it's sort of being managed for um particularly for the bobolinks so that's yeah. nice right. so so, you, so have, you could park there and walk back up the road because there's no parking area for this particular right. cemetery right. right yeah and if you want to know more about birds you can join us on some bird walks Right. We have lots of them coming up. Yep. Okay, the next cemetery is, um, let's see. Oh, 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 this is, oh, yes, I'm confused. Mm, that's nothing new. Okay, so this one is in Chardon. It's on Menor Road, like as, as if you were going towards Menor. And it's uh, Center Chardon or Larned Cemetery. And go ahead and click for me. And this is just a zoom in of that little fence area. And it shows, it says Larned Cemetery on there. Okay. Now crisscrossing back to Bainbridge Township. This is Route 306. 
at the bottom of a very steep hill um, near um, where Tanglewood Country Club is. So this is the McFarland Cemetery. I haven't gone into the cemetery. I know that it's well maintained, but um, the problem is where to park and how not to get run over and become a resident <laughs> of the cemetery. So um, I eventually will try to do that. But yeah, that's all you really see. It's it's up in, in the woods. You see it at this time of year when there are no leaves, leaves on, on the trees. Yeah. And I'll drive past it going way too fast yeah. and say, oh, I really wish I could stop. Okay. All right, Pioneer Cemetery. How did I find this cemetery? Because of, yes, you guessed it, a geocache hidden there. Um, so this is at the corner of Pioneer Road and Madison Road, which is 528 right. in Huntsburg. And um, there's this an interesting- This is a great story. Yeah, this is cool. It has an interesting story attached to it. So um, Lewis Hunt, who was buried there, so Huntsburg, Hunt, Lewis Hunt, um, was one of several prominent farmers and landowners who helped to formally organize these things called jollifications. Another word for jollification is fair, uh, which were annual gatherings held during the summer by the earliest settlers in Geauga County. So can you all guess which jollification founded in 1823 continues to this day in Jaga County. And if you're thinking the, the great, great Jaga, Jaga County, County Fair, Fair, you would be correct. Yeah. So anyway, so it was known as a jollification. <laughs> okay, now here's a cemetery that is, I mean, I couldn't get over finding this cemetery because it's practically in the middle of town. I'm going to see if I can um, zoom in. So hold on as I try to do this. I know everyone gets to see the top of my head. Yes, thank you very much. Okay, so this is where the cemetery is. So this is Mayfield Road. Down here, this is McDonald's. This is Fertile Aster Ski Place. It's in a little house. And then here is the cemetery. It's practically right in town. There, there are houses all around it. And okay. Okay, so that's where this is, and um, you can't really see it. It is fairly hidden because this is really tall, like um, juniper hedge. It's um, I couldn't hardly see into it at all, but there it is, practically in the middle of Chesterland. I mean, it is in it is in the middle of Chesterland. It's called Quirk Cemetery, Chester Cemetery, Woodside Cemetery. So that is another interesting thing is that some of these cemeteries have multiple names. So if you think it's called something, you uh, try another name. You might find it under another name if you're looking for a specific cemetery. On, on the find a grave yeah, site. Yeah, on that yeah. find a grave site. Yeah. So go ahead. And okay, another cemetery you might speed by. I, I speed by this one and say, wow, that was a cemetery. It's practically in the road. And it is practically in the road. This is on Mayfield Road, very close to Sperry Road, and it's called Old Settlement Cemetery. And I did look into the, the oldest grave here was from 1804, and that was of John Minor, and he was a private in the 6th and 7th Connecticut Regiment of the Revolutionary War. So here it is, practically in the middle of the road, and, and, and there it is. And finally, so this is our last cemetery. This cemetery is truly hidden. This cemetery is actually on the property of someone that I know in, in their woods. So it's you know on private property, you can't get to it. And um, basically its beauty is only observed by the beautiful nature and the encroaching natural world. So a little bit of cemetery etiquette. So before we uh, start taking questions. So take only photos, leave only footprints. You show respect for the families that might be at the cemetery visiting 
um, a loved one's grave or attending a funeral. Just, you know, stay, stay clear of them, maintain a quiet and respectful demeanor. So, you know, not no loud noises or running around. And if you bring your children with you, don't allow them at all to, to climb on the grave markers. Yeah. Like the geocaching says, cash in, litter out, um, cash in, trash out. So don't litter. Um, so occasionally when we've done cemetery programs on some of the more modern tombstones, we've done um, rubbings where you put a piece of paper against the stone and rub over and you get an image of whatever yeah. symbol. Don't do that with these old fragile stones, the sandstone ones. I mean, just putting any kind of a pressure on them could just knock them over. It, it, it's so sad that some of them are just so degraded that you, you can't hardly even read the names on them anymore. Um, be respectful. Uh, don't remove any of the markers or the flowers or in, interfere with any of the plants or wildlife. I, this is all common sense stuff. Right. But um, sometimes things look like trash to you, and they're and they're not. Right. They might be a token. Somebody might have left. Somebody right. might have left a candy wrapper, and you think, "Oh, it's a trash." It's can that could be that somebody left it there because that person liked Snickers or something. Yeah. I don't, you know. I, I um, never remove anything, even if I think it might be trash, unless it's like out in the middle, middle it's not right. on a gravestone, but if it's on a gravestone, I don't, I don't touch it. Right. And of course, there's a whole thing about the coins and what they mean. I didn't write anything about that. Um, that's something that you can look up online. So even if you think it might be trash, if it's on a gravestone, don't, don't leave it be, don't right. move it. And finally, and I think this is common sense to cemeteries that are on private property, um, just ask permission to go there if if you want to visit. Don't just assume that it's okay to go visit. So um, anyway, I think that wraps it up for us. We